Today in the workshop, we're using CircuitPython with the Raspberry Pi Pico. I'll show you how to build a keyboard and mouse emulator and how to work with a micro SD card. We'll also create an array of colors with an addressable RGB light strip. We're speaking another language today, so welcome to the workshop. Well, hello and welcome to the workshop and today we are back working with the Raspberry Pi Pico, the brand new microcontroller from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Today we're going to be programming the Pico using a different programming language. Last time we used MicroPython and today we're going to be using CircuitPython. Now before I explain the differences between MicroPython and CircuitPython, I think I should answer the obvious question. Why? Why are we using CircuitPython instead of MicroPython? Why are we not using C++, which as I mentioned in the last video, is another language you can use to program the Pico. And in order to answer that question, I need to put a little bit of context behind this. Now, if you're watching this video when I first put it out, I think you obviously know that I filmed this near the end of February 2021. But if you're watching in the future when we have things like flying cars and Star Trek transporters, you probably will wonder why is he using CircuitPython when we can use C++. Well, the reason is that because the Raspberry Pi Pico is in its infancy right now, a lot of these things are still under development, but that development is proceeding very quickly. And the reason it's proceeding so quickly is that Raspberry Pi is not going to be the only company with an RP2040 based microcontroller board very soon. Already Pi Moroni, SparkFun, Adafruit, and Arduino have announced that they are going to be creating boards based on this chip, and that is going to change the landscape drastically. All of these companies produce high quality devices. SparkFun and Adafruit produce amazing documentation and you know they'll come up with tutorials, they'll come up with libraries, and they'll really expand what you can do with MicroPython and the Raspberry Pi Pico. But the real development, I think, is Arduino. Arduino has announced that the Arduino Nano RP2040 Connect board will be available for pre-order very soon. And this is a Raspberry Pi RP2040 board, which also has Bluetooth and Wi-Fi capabilities. And the big deal is that Arduino is also going to add the RP2040 boards into its family of boards that it supports in the Arduino IDE, meaning all of the code that we use and all of the libraries in the Arduino IDE will soon be available to the Pico and other boards based around the RP2040. And so I don't think at this junction in time I'm going to be getting into doing C++ programming with it because this is just on the horizon and in a couple of months we'll have a lot of other resources and no doubt platform io and other ides will follow and they'll have support for these boards okay so why circuit python and not MicroPython? well again it's because of the newness of everything MicroPython does indeed work on the rp2040 boards but it is limited. There are a lot of functions that aren't available yet. They are to be coming soon. Whereas CircuitPython has an existing library of all kinds of code, almost 300 libraries we can pick on, the support from Adafruit and documentation. So it's a very good thing to be using on a microcontroller like the Raspberry Pi Pico. So let's go and take a look at CircuitPython and how it differs from MicroPython. CircuitPython is a beginner-friendly, open-source version of Python. This is an offshoot of MicroPython that was developed by Adafruit. CircuitPython was originally for the Adafruit SAMD21, or M0, boards. It now supports over 175 different boards from multiple manufacturers. There are over 300 CircuitPython libraries and drivers available. You can also use other Python libraries with CircuitPython by using the Adafruit Blinka library. 
CircuitPython supports native USB on all of the boards that it supports. You can perform your editing with any code editor and don't require any special tools. Floats or decimals are supported on all builds, although boards like the Raspberry Pi Pico that use the M0 processor support this in software and not hardware. A CircuitPython board will appear as a disk drive on the connected computer. MicroPython was originally developed by Damien George in Australia in 2014. CircuitPython is a fork of MicroPython and was developed by Adafruit in 2017. MicroPython was originally part of a Kickstarter project with a product called the Pi Board. CircuitPython was originally developed for Adafruit boards. MicroPython allows current files to share the same state. CircuitPython is much simpler, where files run one at a time. One advantage of MicroPython is that it supports interrupts, whereas CircuitPython does not support interrupts. On the Raspberry Pi Pico, the build of CircuitPython is available on a UF2 file. To install CircuitPython, you copy the UF2 file into the Pico's RPI-RP2 folder. This will create a new disk drive named CircuitPy. Inside this drive is a file called code.py, and this is the main file. When you make a change to code.py, they will run immediately. No uploading is required. So now let's install CircuitPython on our Raspberry Pi Pico. Now, of course, the first step in working with CircuitPython is installing CircuitPython, so you'll need to get a copy of the installation file, which you can do from the circuitpython.org webpage. In their download section, you can search for the Raspberry Pi Pico, and you will come to this page, and you'll also find the link to this page, of course, in the article that accompanies this video on the DroneBot Workshop website. At the top of the page, we have the option to download the latest UF2 file, and that's what what we're going to need to do and I've actually already done that and so here it is in my download directory the Adafruit CircuitPython Raspberry Pi Pico. Now I'm going to need to open a drive on the Pico and as you recall the way that we do that is that we hold down the boot cell key while we plug the Pico into our computer and then we release the boot cell key and the drive appears but there's another way of doing that as well. All you need to do is actually place a push button switch between the reset pin which is pin 30 on the Pico and one of its grounds and there's a convenient ground here on pin 28. Now our friend Andreas the fellow with the Swiss accent has actually taken this one step further and he's got a great video out where he places a reset switch in between pin 30 and that nearby ground and that's a pretty eloquent way of doing that. Myself I've just done it with an external push button switch because I'm going to need a couple of push buttons for our experiments today anyway. You have to do sort of a little dance over here. Hold the reset key down, hold down boot cell, release reset, and then release the boot cell key. And you'll get this thing here that says a removable drive has been inserted. And we can open that. And this is the RPI-RP2 drive that you were familiar with when we installed MicroPython. Well, we're going to do the same thing for CircuitPython. So I'm going to drag that into here and let it copy. And once it does, the drive will close and another one will open and that drive is called circuit pi and that's the drive that we're going to be working in now you'll notice it already comes with a folder called lib which is where we're going to install libraries there's a file called boot underscore out dot txt and one called code dot py and code dot py is the file that we are going to be working with when this machine boots now it is going to run code dot py in fact anytime we make a change to code dot py will run. So in order to work with this file we're going to need an editor and for that reason we're going to install another editor one called the mu editor. 
Now you can use just about any text editor that you prefer to work with CircuitPython. However, the MU editor has a lot of advantages, especially for beginners. So I recommend this when you're just starting. Now you can install a version for Windows or Mac OS X by downloading the file from their web page. You can also install it under Linux. Generally, all you'll need to do is use the command line. I just did sudo apt-get MU on my Ubuntu workstation and it installed just fine. There's a download here that's labeled for Raspbian, which is the old name for the Raspberry Pi operating system. But I'm using a Raspberry Pi and there's another way to install MU. So I'm going to close my web browser and go up here to Preferences and go to Recommended Software. And here we have a list of recommended programs for the Pi. I'm going to type in MU in the search box. And here it is. Here's the MU editor, a Python IDE for beginners. Now all you need to do is check this box and hit apply and it will install. I've already done that. So let's go and open MU, which you'll find under the programming group. And we've opened up MU and we've got an untitled over here that says write your code. Now you're going to need to put it into the correct mode. Since I've done this already, it is in the correct mode. You can see it says Adafruit down the corner, but you can always hit the mode button here and choose your mode. And I've got Adafruit Circuit Python chosen. Now if I hit the serial button over here, I will open up a window down here and this is where I can enter into the command line if I wish. To. I'll just hit enter to do that. And I'm at the command line for CircuitPython right now, and you can see that over here. And so what I'm going to do at my command line is just give it a simple command. And I'll hit enter to run that. And there it comes back and it prints welcome to the workshop. And I can hit control D to get out of there if I wish. Now I can also install a file and I can use the load button for that. And it opens up in my CircuitPy directory and you see code.py. And as I said earlier, this is the file that is going to run when we boot up the Raspberry Pi Pico. So any change to this file will also run dynamically. So here's code.py right now. I'm going to make a small change to it. Hello there world. And I'm going to save my change. And as you can see down in the bottom over here, as soon as I saved it, it ran. And so that's a great feature of working with CircuitPython. You don't actually do an upload. You just make modifications to code.py. Now before we get into all of our experiments, I want to load one more Python script onto our Raspberry Pi Pico just to make certain that everything is working correctly. And in my documents folder, I've got a number of Python scripts. They're the ones we're going to be working with today. This one, Pico Blink, you can probably guess what it does, is what we're going to be using. And I could have used the load button to open that, but another way of doing that is just drag it over to the editor and it opens up in its own window. And I think that's a pretty nice little feature. Now this is Pico Blink. It is a Python script that essentially does the same thing as the Blink sketch does on the Arduino. And you'll notice we import a number of libraries into it. And some of the libraries have different names than the ones that we were used to when we worked with MicroPython. CircuitPython libraries are just named differently. Digital I.O. is the library that works with the I.O. pins. And that's the one that we're going to be using to blink the LED on and off. And we've set the LED up over here as a digital in out, and then we've set it specifically as an output, and that's similar to what we use in MicroPython. And then while true, we set the LED value to true, which puts it on. We sleep for half a second, set it to false, and then sleep for half a second, and repeat. So there we go, the blink sketch. Now, the easiest way that I've found in order to get that into code pi is simply to copy it. So I'm going to do a control A and a control C to copy. And then I'm gonna go into code.py, do a control A and a control V, and there it is here. And I'm going to save that right now. And of course, as soon as I save it, it should start running. And if you look at my Pico, you can see indeed that I am now blinking an LED. So this is the way that we are going to operate with the MU editor 
and modify the code.py file in our experiments today. Now, in addition to its use as a microcontroller, the Raspberry Pi Pico can also be used as a USB device. And in the last video, I mentioned that a very good application for this would be to build a keyboard emulator. And that's exactly what we are going to build for our first experiment. Now, a keyboard emulator is a custom keyboard with custom keys designed for a specific application. And the application I've chose to build an emulator for is Audacity, the open source audio processing application, which is basically a recording studio in a box. Now, for my simple emulator, I'm going to only emulate two of the buttons, the record button and the stop button. But of course, I could add extra push buttons and build a full-fledged emulator for Audacity and I may just do that one day because I make a lot of use of Audacity. All the audio in these videos is processed with Audacity. So let me show you how we can hook a couple of push buttons up to the Pico and then I'll show you the code to build your own custom keyboard emulator. To construct our keyboard emulator we will of course need a Raspberry Pi Pico and a couple of push buttons. I'm showing a red one and a black one but of course you can use any color you like. I'll be using the red button as my record button and the black button as my stop button. We'll start by wiring one side of the red push button switch to pin 24 of the Raspberry Pi Pico. That's GPIO pin 18. We'll wire one side of the black push button to pin 25 of the Pico, which is GPIO 19. Finally, we'll wire the 3.3 volt output on pin 36 of the Pico to the other side of both push button switches. And this completes the wiring of our keyboard emulator. Now let's take a look at the code we'll use in order to make it work. Now before we begin, we're going to need to add an additional library to our CircuitPython setup. And so what we do is we go to the CircuitPython library page and we download the latest version of the library bundle, and that's this one over here. And that will download as a zip file, which we will then extract. Inside that, we will see dozens and dozens of libraries, but we only really want one, and the one we want is the Adafruit HID, or Human Interface Device Library, because a keyboard is a human interface device. Now, how we install that is we go into the folder that our CircuitPython setup has created, the drive we've set up, and you'll notice there's a lib folder inside here. What I want you to do is just take the whole folder of that Adafruit HID library and copy it into there and that'll be sufficient to install the library. Once you've done that we can go on with our code. And so here's the code that I have for our keyboard emulator. Now for Audacity I'm going to be emulating two keys, the record and the stop. And the record is the R key on the keyboard and the stop is the space bar. But you can use any keys you want. You can use a as many as you want and you can also use combinations such as shift and control as well. Now we begin by importing a number of libraries. A time library is the one we use for making time delays and the board library for working with our board. Digital I.O. is the library that is used for the I.O. ports and we'll need this for the push button and we're also importing a library called USB HID to let us know that we want to use the USB port as a human interface face device. Then we use the Adafruit HID library and we import a number of things. We import keyboard because we're building a keyboard. We also need to import our keyboard layout and I'm using a US keyboard layout on my computer. Now if you're using a different one then you will change this for example if you're using a UK layout. And the article that accompanies this video has a link to the documentation for this library that will show you the value you can use for any keyboard layout. We also import key code because that's what we're going to be creating is key code. We create a keyboard object and a keyboard layout object over here and then we set up our two buttons. Now our record button is a digital I.O. 
with a digital input on GPIO 18. We are setting that up as an input as opposed to being an output and we are invoking the internal pull down resistor because remember we wired this so that when we click the button we are pulling it up. We are connecting it to 3.3 volts. The stop button is wired up in exactly the same way and so the code for it is identical except it goes to GPIO 19 instead of 18. And then in the true loop, all we are doing is we are looking to see if the button has been pressed. If the record button has been pressed, we do a keyboard press and then we send it out the key code. Now I'm using the letter R and the key code R will go out. Now this will actually be a lowercase r despite the fact that it's uppercase over here. If I wanted to make an uppercase, I could put two things within my bracket. I would do a key code dot shift and then a comma and then key code dot R and that would be a shift R which would be an uppercase R and you can use that technique to use any combination of keys. After we've pressed it we're going to give it a slight delay to hold it down and then we do a keyboard release and so this is basically the pattern we do for every button and you can keep repeating this for as many buttons as you have. So I've got the R button and I've got the space button done over here. Then we put in a slight time delay over here for debouncing purposes and do everything all over again. And so that is our code. Let's go and take a look at it now working with Audacity. And so here's our setup to test our keyboard emulator for Audacity. And of course I've got everything set on the solderless breadboard with the Pico and a couple of push buttons. And I've also got this big and rather ugly microphone over here. It's a USB mic that is plugged into my Raspberry Pi right now. And I'll be using that just to demonstrate Audacity. Now before we demonstrate Audacity, let's make certain that our keypad emulator is really working. And the easy way to do that is just to go down into a text editor. Now Audacity needs an R for record, so my red button should produce an R, and indeed it does, and it needs a space for stop, so here we have a space. So we've got the R's and some spaces, so that seems to work pretty nicely. Let's just close this, and no, we don't wish to save it. I've got Audacity open over here, so let's hit the R button, and we're recording, and as you can see, it's basically picking up our sound right now that we're making and of course we're making a wonderful recording. Now let's hit the stop button and it stops. And so I've basically made a two key keypad for Audacity and of course I could add additional keys to this to emulate all of the keys up over here. Audacity is pretty nice because it also allows you to define custom key codes and so I could make a full-fledged keypad for Audacity and I may indeed just do that because now I know I can make one just using a few push buttons and a Raspberry Pi Pico. And of course you could do this for any other application that doesn't have to be Audacity. Anything you can work Work on with the keyboard you could build an emulator for. Now another very popular human interface device is a mouse and the Adafruit HID library is also capable of mouse emulation. And so for our next experiment we are going to use the Raspberry Pi Pico and turn it into a mouse and we are going to be using a joystick to move our cursor around the screen and we're going to use the same two buttons that we used in our previous experiment as our left and our right mouse button. So let's go and see how we added joystick to the Pico and then I'll show you how we can use the HID library to emulate a mouse. In order to construct our mouse emulator we'll begin with the same circuit we used for the keyboard emulator with the two push button switches. We will also add a joystick that has two resistive controls on it. We'll begin by connecting the x-axis output of the joystick to pin 31 of the Raspberry Pi Pico. That's the input for analog to digital converter 0. The y-axis output of the joystick will be connected to pin 32 of the Pico, which is ADC1. The 3.3 volt output from the Raspberry Pi Pico on pin 36 is connected to the VCC connection on our joystick. And finally, we'll connect one of the grounds from the Pico to the joystick's ground. I used the one on pin 33, which is also known as the analog ground. And this completes the wiring of our mouse emulator.
Now let's take a look at the code we can use to make our joystick act like a mouse. Now here's the code that we're going to be using for our mouse emulator and this code is actually just sample code that came from the Adafruit CircuitPython Essentials HID mouse example. I have modified the code however the original code used the push button that is integrated into the joystick as a left mouse button and it did not have a right mouse button. I just simply brought it out to two independent buttons for the left and the right. Now you'll notice that this code uses the analog I.O. library. This is the library that we use for working with the analog to digital converter. And again, we're using the USB HID and the Adafruit HID library, and we're importing an object called mouse. We define the mouse over here as a USB HID device. And we define the x-axis and y-axis inputs as being analog A0 and analog A1. The two buttons are defined exactly as we did in the last experiment. And the left button and the right button for the mouse, they're again using pull-down resistors because when the buttons are pressed, they will be pulled high because the other side is connected to 3.3 volts. We define a minimum and a maximum value for a potentiometer, and this is based upon the fact, again, that we're using 3.3 volts. And then we break it down into steps because we really don't want to break it into 65,536 individual steps. Instead, we'd like to break it down into 20 individual ones. And then we define a couple of functions. The first one is to get the voltage on the pin, and this is just a generic function you can use to get voltage off of an analog pin. It multiplies it by 3.3, which is the reference voltage, and divides by 65,536 because it is a 16-bit number. We also define the steps axis over here, and basically we put in the axis, the x or y one, and we return a rounded result of that because we don't want fractional values over here. Now we'll get into the true loop and we define the x and y inputs as being the get voltage of the x-axis and the y-axis. So basically these are the voltages that we are getting and we define our two buttons over here. Now if the left button has been clicked we call the left button function. If the right one has been clicked we call the right button one and of course we add a slight time delay over here as a debounce. Now over here is where we use the steps and you'll notice we use them in both positive and negative for both the x and y axis and the reason they're doing this is that you want to make it so that as you move the mouse, excuse me, the joystick out toward the edge, you want the mouse to move faster because otherwise it's going to take forever to get to the center of the screen. But when you're nearer to the center of the joystick, you want more precise control. And so basically that's why they've defined it into two discrete steps for both the negative and positive side because of course the mouse can move in either direction. And so that's basically the code. As I said, it was derived from an Adafruit example and I've got it loaded right now. So let's go take a look. I can go and move my joystick. And as you can see, I can move my cursor over here. Wonderful. And I can also use the buttons. Let's use the right mouse button and that brings up a menu and the left mouse button. Let's get the cursor somewhere over here the left mouse button highlights things. So this does work and it's a very simple method of using a joystick and a couple of push buttons and a Raspberry Pi Pico to emulate a mouse. Now the last time we looked at the Raspberry Pi Pico we added a display to it and that used the I2C bus but one bus that we didn't work with was the SPI bus and so for our next experiment we are going to interface a micro SD card which uses the SPI bus to the Raspberry Pi Pico and so let's go and see how we hook that up and how we use CircuitPython to both read and write to a micro SD card. For our experiment with the micro SD card, we will require a Raspberry Pi Pico and a micro SD card module. We'll begin by connecting the master out slave in or MOSI pin on the SD card to pin 15 on the Raspberry Pi Pico. This is GPIO 11.
The master in, slave out, or MISO pin on the SD card will be connected to pin 16 on the Pico, which is GPIO 12. The SCK or clock signal on the SD card will be connected to pin 14 on the Pico, that's GPIO 10, and the CS or select line on the SD card will be connected to pin 20 on the Pico, which is GPIO 15. Now although our module works on 3.3 volts, it actually requires a 5 volt VCC as it has an onboard regulator. Therefore, we will connect the VCC pin on the SD card to pin 40 of the Pico, which is the VBUS output. And finally, we'll connect the ground on the SD card to one of the grounds on the Pico. I chose the ground on pin 18, but you could use any of the Pico grounds. And this completes the wiring. Now let's take a look at the code. Now this is just a simple test of our micro SD card. All we are going to do is we're going to write some data to the card and then we're going to read it back. But of course you can expand upon this to do anything you want with the SD card. Now we begin by importing a number of libraries, some that we've seen before and a few that we haven't, including the bus IO, the SD card IO and the storage library. We then define the connections to our SPI bus. So we got MOSI going to GPIO 11, MISO to GPIO 12, the clock signal on GPIO 10, and the select line on GPIO 15. We then define an SPI object using the bus IO library and its SPI property. We pass to it the clock signal plus the MOSI, which is master out serial in, and the MISO, master in serial out connections. Then we define an SD object to represent our SD card and we use the SDIO. We use the SD card property of that and we point to the SPI connection we've made and the select line because of course we could have multiple cards on here and they could have different select lines. We define the storage that we're going to be using and we're going to be using FAT storage or file allocation table and that's how our micro SD card has been formatted and we're going to mount the micro SD card and we're going to go into a directory called SD. Over here what I'm doing is taking a reading that I'm going to print onto the card and what I'm reading over here is the temperature sensor that's built into the Pico so I thought we'd see how we could use that as well. So I'm defining a variable called temp and I'm just using microcontroller.cpu.temperature and that will give me the temperature reading. Now this will be read as an object and will have to be formatted before we can write it onto the micro SD card. So now let's begin writing to our micro SD card. We open a file called pico.txt and in this particular case we're opening it for writing and what that means is we're going to create the file right now and we're going to mount it into this location we've already defined. And then we're going to write to the file and I'm just going to write a sentence to the file and at the end of the sentence put a carriage return and a line feed so I write we have opened the file. Now I'm going to add a second entry to the file and you'll notice instead of a W over here I've put an A because it's an addition to an already existing file. So after the first operation everything after that becomes an A or an addition. So we're going to add a second entry to the file. And then we'll add a third entry and this is where we're going to use our temperature. And this is the formatting line over here that we use. So it is currently formatted value C because we're taking the value in Celsius. And over here I show the format. So I'm going to format the temperature variable and that's going to appear over here in our text string. Now that we've written to the file, we're going to read it back. And so over here, we use an R operation to read our file. We're going to print reading from the micro SD card. Remember, that's just going to print on the command line. And then for every line in the file, we are just going to print the line and then end it. So it's a pretty simple demonstration. Let's open our serial monitor and let's do a control D to reload this. And there we have it. Let's scroll for that. So we have opened the file. Now we've added the second entry to our file. It's currently 19.18, quite a lot of decimal places in our degrees Celsius. Rather cool here in the workshop. 
and the code has been done running because we've read back the contents of our file. And so that's a simple test, but it shows how we can read and write a micro SD card using CircuitPython on the Raspberry Pi Pico. Now for our final experiment, I'm going to hook up a string of addressable RGB LEDs to the Pico, and I'm going to use a library from Adafruit in order to control them. Now if you're not familiar with what an addressable RGB LED is, or how it differs from a regular one, you can check out a video I did a couple of years ago about the subject. It may be a few years old, but it is still as valid today as it was back then. So let's go and take a look at the hookup, and then I'll show you the code that we can use to bring a little bit of color into the workshop. For the experiment with the addressable RGB LEDs, you'll require a Raspberry Pi Pico and a strip of addressable RGB LEDs. You could use Adafruit NeoPixels or the equivalent. You'll also require a power supply for the RGB LEDs. This will be a 5 volt supply with sufficient current for the number of LEDs that you have. We'll begin by connecting the input line of the addressable RGB strip to pin 1 of the Raspberry Pi Pico. This is GPIO 0. We'll connect the positive side of our 5 volt power supply to the positive 5 volt in on the addressable RGB strip. We'll connect the negative side of our power supply to the negative or ground input on our addressable RGB LED strip. And we'll also connect this ground to one of the Pico's grounds. I'm showing the ground on pin 18, but you can use any of them. And this completes our wiring. Now let's go and take a look at a couple of code examples. Now in order to work with our addressable RGB LEDs, we're going to need to install another library, and this is the Adafruit NeoPixel library. NeoPixel is their trade name for their addressable RGB LEDs. You'll find a link to that library on the article that accompanies this video on the DroneBotWorkshop.com website. And again, it's installed in the lib folder, only this time instead of a folder, it is just simply one file, NeoPixel.p that we're installing. Once we've done that, we can run some of the sample code that Adafruit has provided for this, and here's one that is just going to turn all the NeoPixels red. And so basically it imports the board and that NeoPixel library. Now one thing we need to do to this is we need to change this to the number of NeoPixels that we have. And I have 28 on mine, oops, not 8, 28. Otherwise, that's the only modification I need to make. They basically set up an object called pixels. They set the brightness of the pixels. And then while true, they do pixels fill and then the RGB value. And this is going to be red because it got red at 255 and green and blue at zero. And so if we take a look, we can see that we indeed have a number of red NeoPixels glowing right now. Now let's go back into our code and modify it a bit. Let's make this 255 over here and we'll save that. And as you can see, we have now got both a combination of red and green over here. I can change that first one now back to a zero, save it again. And we've just got green over here. And of course, if we go to the last one over here and make that 255 and make this into a zero and save it. And we have blue. And so we can regulate the color of our Neo pixels very simply. And so one final bit of code from Adafruit that's a lot of fun to use with the NeoPixels is this one called Rainbow. And it imports both the NeoPixel library and it also imports something called Color Wheel. Now I've adjusted mine to match the number of RGB LEDs that I have, but otherwise I haven't made any changes to this. And the real uh, function behind this is this function over here called Rainbow, in which it changes both speed and color as it cycles through all of the different colors using this color wheel function. And so in the true, we just do while true rainbow. And if you take a look at the results over here, you can indeed see that we have a rainbow of lights 
using a number of addressable RGB LEDs and our Raspberry Pi Pico and Circuit Python. Okay, that brings us to the end of the video for today. I hope that you enjoyed it, and I hope that it's also opened your eyes to the fact that you can use multiple programming languages with a microcontroller like the Raspberry Pi Pico. Now, what is the best language to use with the Pico? Well, there is no real answer to that. It's similar to the tools that you see behind me. For example, I have a number of different needle nose pliers over here. Now, I could probably get by with just one set of needle nose pliers, but there are times where I want a set that's a bit longer or a set that has a bent tip as opposed to a straight one and so I have different ones that are better for different jobs and it's the same thing with programming languages you use the language that is best suited to the application that you're trying to build and in many cases it might indeed be CircuitPython now if you want some more information about CircuitPython or if you'd like to get the code for all the examples that I used today or the hookup diagrams, you will find those in the article on the DroneBotWorkshop.com website. There is a link to that article right below this video. And while you are on the website, please consider signing up for my newsletter. It's not a sales letter, it's just my way of keeping in touch with you to let you know what's going on with the workshop. And I'd also like to mention that in the next newsletter I send out, I'm going to be sending you a number of different resources for learning Python, because learning Python Python is important whether you're going to be learning MicroPython or CircuitPython. You really need a good basis in Python. And so I'm going to give you a link to a number of resources, both articles and videos that you can use in order to increase your knowledge of that language. If you'd like to discuss this video, well, you know where to go. The best place to do that is on the DroneBot Workshop forums, where we have a bunch of amazing people who love to discuss electronics, microcontrollers, programming, and all sorts of things. And so if that sounds like you, and if you haven't joined yet, please see the link below this video to get information on how you can become a forum member. And of course, finally, if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, well, what are you waiting for? I do videos about microcontrollers and electronics and robotics and all sorts of things and I'm sure you'll find those just absolutely fascinating. So in order to subscribe, just hit that subscribe button and when you do that, also hit the bell notification. And as long as you've got notifications enabled on your YouTube, you will get notified every time that I make a new video. So until I make another video, please take care of yourselves, please stay safe, and we will see you again very soon here in the DroneBot Workshop. Goodbye for now.